Hi, everyone. Just letting everyone on right now. And um, we will be with you shortly. Just give us a few moments. Just want to get everyone in the room. Good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Lake, your moderator for this evening on behalf of Private School Village. Welcome to this very important conversation about the race talk. Yes, enough is enough. It is time for us to get serious about conversations surrounding race, how we raise our children, how we speak to our children, how we inform them, and how we raise them. So I wanna thank Lisa Johnson and Private School Village for being daring enough to take on this very important conversation. And it is truly my pleasure to moderate. I've got some incredible panelists here for you today. And uh, we're gonna get into it shortly. But first off, a little bit about me. I am a lawyer and a television host. I'm also a mom of a son at a private school. My son CJ goes to Merman School. And so I experience many of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, and in addition, I'm very comfortable having these um, uncomfortable conversations because some of this will be uncomfortable. Uh, I do this regularly as co-chair of a multicultural discussion group at Merman School called the Mosaic. And so at Mosaic, we do this every Friday. We talk, we dig into issues, we talk about race, we talk about culture, we talk about prejudice. Uh, and so I'm excited to have a community as large as this to join in the conversation. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Number one, this event will be recorded, just so you know. Number two, the chat feature is um, disabled. We're going to be using the Q&A feature, but pri uh, priority will be given to those people who uh, sent in questions before uh, the start of this particular webinar. And also, I'm not going to do an entire introduction with bios of our incredible gracious panelists. <laughs> they are highly esteemed, but we want to spend the bulk of our time talking about the issues. So if you'd like to learn more about them, please see the bio on the email you received uh, after you registered. So I'd like to introduce briefly our incredible panelists. We have Christina Lear, writer, actor, and organizer, uh, white people for Black Lives. Yes. And we also have Dr. Shelley Touchluck, an educator and author of Witnessing Whiteness. Welcome, ladies, to this incredible discussion. And um, listen, I want to make sure everyone understands the goal of this discussion is to create a safe space and a brave space to talk about issues that many have not talked about with their children. Many are on this call that are well informed about uh, these issues and some maybe not. And so we are going to take these questions and try to explore the issue as much as we possibly can. If you feel uncomfortable, great. That's where growth begins with feeling uncomfortable. And so uh, sit back and enjoy a discussion that I think is going to be so very much worthy of your time. Before we get started, I'd like to invite our panelists to just take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about their platforms, their mission, their messaging. I'd like to start with you, Shelley, if you don't mind jumping in and telling our audience a little bit about what you do. Well, first, I want to acknowledge that I am not a parent. And so um, I do not have the experience of having to have the talk with a child of mine. Um, what I do have is a lot of experience um, in the past as an elementary school teacher. It was actually as a teacher of a lot of black and brown kids in Inglewood, where I first started recognizing my need to pay attention to race. And I have been paying attention to what it means to be white ever since, 
trying to guide and support other white people to enter that conversation um, as healthfully as possible so that we can do um, the least damage as possible when we're in multiracial situations and actually heal ourselves from the racism that um, pervades and, and starts to to come into to our own um, bodies, minds, and spirits. Um, and what I'll just start off by saying is that, you know, my experience reading the chapter that I believe was sent out to everybody called Nurture Shock, um, it was called Why White Parents Don't Talk About Race. I mean, to me, that lays things out really plainly in terms of why we need to educate kids and ourselves about race. It let's us know that white parents find the subject of race anxiety provoking largely, and we don't generally know how to to address it competently. Um, and we need to consider that most white teachers have the same problem. Um, white people still make up about 80 to 90% of the teaching force in the United States. And the situation itself exemplifies what white privilege is. Mm -hmm. A core part of white privilege includes white people not being required to see ourselves as racial beings for the majority of our lives. Um, whites have been considered the default the default in books and in movies and in research studies, in the language that white people use um, to see ourselves simply as individuals, not as white people who need to grapple with what it means to be white. Kids of color don't have that luxury. And so parents of color are forced into having the talk with their kids, but it's a talk that involves more than just warnings about police abuse, um, but the preparation for a lifetime of dealing with prejudice and racism. And it comes with a heavy dose of language meant to inspire pride, which is a necessary bulwark against society's negative messaging. So something that has helped me get through to people, especially other white people that I talk to when I'm raising these issues, is naming that white privilege is actually just one of many types of privilege. For example, there is a class-based privilege, there's heterosexual privilege, there's religious privilege, privilege based on education or nationality, among others. Um, and if you're part of the dominant group within any of these categories, it comes with advantages. So myself as a white, middle-class, straight, cisgendered US citizen, many of the categories that I inhabit provide me with privileges. And based on this, there's a lot of battles that I just don't need to fight. Each of them makes a difference in my life. It needs to be kept in mind is that the development and implementation of race as a concept is one of the core wounds of our country. And so for every instance of injury to a black person, there's been a corresponding benefit for a white person. One might accurately suggest that we've had affirmative action for white people in the United States for about 400 years, with maybe a decade or so when some efforts to offer a corrective were actually attempted. My first direct suggestion, I'm just going to jump into one suggestion for every white person listening to this, is to read the book White Rage by Carol Anderson. She wrote the book after the uprisings in 2016, when the media kept pressing the question, why are black people so angry? And Anderson flipped that question in a very accessible historical review. It reveals that at every single point in US history, when black people as a group were making great strides forward, white people descended upon them with a rage for which there's been no redress, no healing, no accountability. So in terms of the need to help kids more consciously grow up in this society that has been so thoroughly marked by inequality, there is no age that's too early to start. Child development researchers let us know that society's messages about the value of light skin seep into children's awareness as early as preschool. And if parents don't actively work to disentangle that messaging, if they never talk about race or about skin color, parents may actually not know what conclusions the kids are drawing on their own for themselves. And when they do find out, a lot of more progressive liberal parents can be extremely disappointed. On the other hand, if white parents engage their own process of understanding race, racism, and racial identity in a sufficiently deep way, 
then we're more confident having the conversation about race with the kids. I mean, I know it's really attractive to want a top 10 list of do's and don'ts for the conversation, and you could probably find it on Google. The problem is that only goes so far to maybe one or two exchanges with your child. As soon as they ask a complex question, you don't have the background in your own personal toolkit, you get lost. So um, I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you for that. In complete transparency, uh, we do want you to understand that the bulk of this conversation, the mission behind this entire webinar, is to help inform, inspire, and empower non-Black families to be able to have that race talk. We do, however, understand that in our audience, there are families from various races and cultures, Black, white, and everything in between. And so I think there's something to be learned from it uh, regardless, but we just want to be transparent about a lot of the information that Shelly and Christina will be sharing today is about creating allies and co-conspirators in the fight against racial injustice. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it, it's important that we understand um, that it is important that we not just become non-racist, right? Angela Davis said that, but we work to be anti-racist. And so that's a powerful statement and just kind of think about that as we continue to share that we are trying to move even from this place of non-racist to anti-racist. Please, Christina, can you share a little bit about um, your platform and your message? Sure. Um, I am here tonight mostly because I am a parent um, and uh, I'm a member of uh, the organization that Lauren mentioned, White People for Black Lives, which is um, a part of a larger national um, fabric of over 130 chapters at this point, and probably in the last few weeks, a few more, um, that seek to move white people into anti-racist action. Um, like Lauren mentioned, um, something that Ibram Kendi talks a lot about. I don't know if people have read Stamped from the Beginning or his new book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, he speaks a lot about how there are, you know, segregationists, there are assimilationists who passively participate in racist systems and, and upholding and voting for um, the continuation of racist systems. And then there's anti, there's active anti-racism. Um, and White People for Black Lives seeks to move people into um, anti-racist action. It's a project of AWARE LA, which Shelley is a founding member of. Um, which is a dialogue space about whiteness and anti-racism. Um, and I found it uh, through a conversation with my child, actually. Um, she was five and she walked into the kitchen when I heard the news that Darren Wilson was acquitted for killing Michael Brown, um, who was an 18-year-old boy, young man, um, and who was shot by a cop. And uh, I just, she saw the look on my face and she said, what's wrong? And for some reason, I, I, in that moment, I told her and I said, I just heard some news that was really upsetting about something that someone did. And she said, what happened? And I said, uh, uh, someone died. And she said, who died? And I said, a, a boy named Michael Brown. And she said, who killed him? And I said, a, a cop a man named Darren Wilson. And she said, why would he do that? And, um, and I said, that's a really good question. And she was looking at me and I don't know whether these were her thoughts, but in my mind, the next question she was going to ask was if, if a cop could kill a boy uh, like Michael Brown. And at the, that time, my daughter's brother was the same age as Michael Brown. And in my mind, she was thinking if he could kill um, Michael Brown, why couldn't he kill me or my brother? And I thought in that moment, I knew that I could pretty much say to her with confidence, the chances of that happening to you are really unlikely. And I also realized in that moment that if I could explain her safety to her by articulating another mother and her child's lack of it, in this case, Michael Brown and his mother, Leslie's, then that wasn't actually safety at all. And it was, um, it was a construction that I couldn't, um, I couldn't get behind, frankly. 
And, um, and so we started to have a conversation about racism and about how people are treated differently because of how they look and bumble through how you talk about that with a young person. And, um, and I really realized in that time that I didn't need only to be having these conversations with her, but that I personally felt like I needed to find out what it meant for me to actively be doing something about them and doing something about these systems. And that's what sought me, uh, what sent me in search of something because I started to try to talk to her friend's parents. And I remember I left my house and I was walking on the street and I called her friend's mom and I said, uh, I just had a conversation with Helen about Michael Brown and um, what are you doing about this? And she said, I'm not talking about it and I don't want you to talk to her about it either. And I very quickly went through this feeling of just, I felt so inept in my ability to, to, to not just be filled with anger and also not be able to have an actually valuable conversation with people that I felt was so essential to have. And I thought there must be people who are doing something about this. And uh, I was very fortunate in about a week's time, I found out about, um, about white people for black lives and somebody actually gave me an article of Shelley's and I went really wanting to know how to have conversations and um, and as a result of that I've gotten very involved in a lot of decarceration work in Los Angeles which is a is a conversation for another time but um, white people for black lives and surge showing up for racial justice what the national um, organization that were a, a, a chapter of work in solidarity with black led and other people of color led work. So we don't create what it is that we think we need to be doing about these systems. We center the work that is created by, by the communities that are most directly affected by these systems and these beliefs. Um, and, and in white people for black lives, we specifically seek bringing other people into the work through that lens. Right. Um, and anyway, I can talk, I can talk perhaps at another time more about that, that well, actual this, work. But this is a really great start. And, you know, as I listen to you ladies um, and think about the work you're, you're doing, uh, I, I am curious to know your thoughts on the state of our country right now, where we are. You know, are there things that surprise you? Or is there something that you've witnessed that seriously concerns you about the reactions we've witnessed uh, as it relates to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, all of the lives we have lost senselessly. Um, what are you thinking about this time? I'm thinking about a lot. Um, and so, so as not to take three hours to say what <laughs> I've been thinking about, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, um, as many have been articulating, I'm sitting holding the tension of both some element of hope along with despair and concern. Um, the one ray of hope that I have found um, is how multiracial the protests look because that's not what happened before. And when I first started with AWARE, it was something that we had to say we were doing in whispers. There was a lot of pushback about white people getting together in a room with each other, um, even with the purpose of working on anti-racism. There was a, a, a level of distrust that was completely understandable because how often do white people get in a room together and something good for black folks comes out of it, right? That's not the norm. Um, but we knew that we needed to get together so that we could work on ourselves, so we could take responsibility for asking ourselves the difficult questions and not harming the people of color and making them burdened um, with the mess that we were in when we were coming to awareness. And I have seen that impulse grow and expand and turn into surge and see that flood, you know, and expand over the course of uh, the last decade over the nation. And 
I'm convinced that all of the daily conversations that a movement of people are having to reconcile themselves and work with their family and friends has allowed people to hear and see things differently than otherwise has happened. So I feel good about that part. Um, I also have deep concerns. I'm not sure that, that that wellspring necessarily means that there's automatically going to be legislative success or that it will stick. I think the, the pushing needs to continue happening. And therefore, I do have a concern because anti-racism is a practice. It is not about the light switch just turning on and suddenly you recognize something that's all good. It is, it's like a muscle that actually has to not just be practiced, but be developed. And for those of us who are just coming to this now, it hurts when you start it for the first time. It, you know, we got to get through the aches and the pains and the difficulty and the mistakes and all of that stuff. And so my mission, quite frankly, is to capture as many white people who have the in interest to get the investment going so that we can create those bonds, the relationships, the support structures, so that we as white people can make sure that we create a habit out of anti-racism. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a daily, a daily initiative in our lives that is so much a fabric of our being that we don't know who we would be without it. That's mm -hmm. actually my goal. And I don't, I don't know that that's going to happen, but I want it to happen. I love that so much because, first of all, I have to say, uh, you know, as a 51-year-old mother, I went down to the protest. Our school went down as a group. Uh, I think it was Friday. And, you know, you watch it on television and you see the white kids, all, all different cultures, Asian kids, white kids, Indian kids, everybody. When you stand in it, though, it really did move me. I, you know, when you stand in it and walk in those crowds with people joining together, and I thought to myself, this was so important for my son CJ to see, but it was also important for me to see. And that was a, a very, I don't know, it was illuminating in a way that at 51 years, I've been on this, this earth 51 years, I had never really felt that level of support. Again, in our discussion group, our room of 20 to 30 parents, yes, but never hundreds, thousands of people together of all races standing there with white kids walking around with Black Lives Matter signs. It was, it was incredible. And to your point about the muscle, I love it as well, um, Shelley, because Reverend Al Sharpton said something profound in uh, his eulogy today, of George Floyd. And he was saying that we don't want this new anti-racist thing, this thing to be just a new way we teach sociology. And I think that just really mm. struck me, like, let it not be the new feather in the cap, like, you know, it's on my uh, uh, resume, you know, I, I also fought for justice. I love that you talked about that it is a practice and it is a muscle that you must grow so that at a certain point, you really don't realize how you got that strong. You knew you worked it, but once it's there, it's not something that you use as just a feather in your cap. It really is a part of the way you move. Um, Christina, I want you to jump in here and talk about the same thing about your thoughts or your hopes, or just like maybe some tangible things that you feel uh, parents can do to help keep their children more aware about all of this. You're a mom, what are you thinking? Well, one of the things that I think about, I love the thing that is being said here about, about the practice. And I love the thing that, that's something I've been thinking a lot about is what, how do we capture all of this energy and turn it into, you know, for many people, it's something as Shelley was talking about in the beginning, we've spent our whole lives never being asked to recognize whiteness. And now we're suddenly a lot of people are talking about changing like every system that's ever you know been known to them and that's going to take some time <laughs> and so i'm thinking a lot about how people are able to be brought in and be oriented to listening something i've, I've noticed a lot perhaps other people have noticed it is that you know when people get activated they also think they know exactly what it is that needs to be done mm -hmm. and there the truth is there are a lot of people, you know, Black Lives Matter wasn't born last week. 
there's a lot of work that's been going on for a really long time that has very thought out and strategic plans and answers to big questions. Um, and, and so I'm thinking a lot about how do you align people to listening and how do you align people to, to looking in other places for information than they've been looking before. Um, and to the thing about kids, like I assume there are people on this call this evening that have very little kids up to grown kids and it can look different, right? Um, you know, not to plug the work that I'm actually doing on a daily basis, but we've been having these because so many things are virtual now. Um, and because people are responding differently to comfort in going out in public spaces, um, we developed these virtual actions first in response to COVID, but um, around pushing the demands around decarceration and taking care of people who are still inside our jails. And so we run these three virtual actions every week. And because they're virtual, they've been this multi-generational space where people are able to bring their children um, or people from across the country are like, or my mother's joining from across the country and my kid will sit with me. And it's an opportunity for children to see parents engaging in conversation or participating in conversation. Um, I did a, a talk with her high school the other day and high school students joined us um, to learn about what it looks like to actually try to shift um, whether it's a legislative choice, whether it's public understanding about how many people we incarcerate, you know, they're just, so, so um, there, it can look a lot of different ways with kids of different ages. Um, and I've been talking to a lot of white parents who um, are nervous about going to the protests and they're wondering whether it's valuable to do the protests on the corner by themselves where they feel safe. And I mean, I have to say, I think it's been great to drive down the street on any various corner and see 10, 15 white people holding up Black Lives Matter signs. And we all need to work together and be together to shift these cultures. Um, I think the last thing that I just wanna say is I went to one of the protests last week and um, you know, we'd seen for the last two months so many images of the anti-shutdown protests um, and the defense of the freedom of speech. And I was at the protest in downtown Los Angeles, which by the way, has been a weekly protest for every week for over two years. And I thought it'll probably be a fairly healthy group this week. It was over 6,000 people. It was extraordinary. Wow. And I have never seen so much police presence in my life. Um, it was extraordinary. And it was just, it, it just hit me in a visceral way about how it, when, when black people are speaking about wanting freedom, they are met with the threat of death. I mean, it was just yes. extraordinary. And the, the crowd was so quiet and people were chanting and there were so many people it would start on one end and go in a wave before the other end could hear what the chant was. But it was quiet enough that people were listening on that level. And the only thing that was interrupting it were the police helicopters that were above us. Yeah. And it was, so it, to go back to the beginning of what we're thinking about today, I'm thinking about the potential and I'm thinking about what we also know can, can happen. Um, and, and so that's what I'm thinking. Well, about. I, I want to follow up with you because when you painted that visual, um, you know, when we came out of the parking structure, it was interesting. My son was walking with his little sign and he had made a sign. He's nine and he's so excited. Um, and um, we walk past, you know, policemen, and we walk by National Guard with rifles, you know, and he looks. And I, it was in that moment that I realized, even in his life, he's really never seen that up close and personal. Mm -hmm. And if he had, he, he, it wasn't directed towards him. It was like in that moment he realized, like, Oh, they're here to police or in some way, you know, 
if necessary, or if it happens, as we've seen all across the nation, harm me. Like people like us that are just coming to protest racial injustice. And it was, it was, it was a daunting moment to see that. And I remember as a mother, I saw, I could tell his fear. He dropped his sign, which isn't like him. He got, and I could tell in that moment he was nervous because I said, I want to take a picture of you. And he kind of was tense. And so I made a point to say hello to one of the men. And he smiled and waved back and said, hello. And I said, say hello. And so it was just this moment of um, where you see it through your children's eyes and it looks different. Mm -hmm. And I want to follow up with a question, you know, to you, Christina, I, I, I want to go to the Q&A. Uh, we have a question that was submitted that says, we're struggling with when and how to have the talk with our six-year-old son. What is the talk at this age? Is it race and or racism? Like, do we name it? And if not, then when? And I thought that was great. I love the part where, where they ask, do we name it? What do you think about that, Christina? At six years old, what does that talk look like, in your opinion? I think what, what I was given a piece of parenting advice, not having to do with a conversation about racism, but I think it's applicable too, which is answer the questions that are asked. Um, because I think they're very informative of what a kid is able to digest and answer. Now, I, I'm, I want to acknowledge that as we know about racism, kids can know by that age to not ask questions. So I'm not saying leave it up to children, but I'm just saying once you start talking to, to that that has always been helpful to me to listen to what the things are that my daughter is actually asking me helps, helps guide me about wh where we can go. Um, and I do think we have to name it because we, because why not, frankly, what are we doing if we're not naming it? Um, and, and, you know, I mean, a, a kid, like Helen said, I don't understand why somebody would be treated differently because of the color of their skin. I mean, that seems like a reasonable thing to ask. It's a reasonable question. Why would somebody, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so you, you then do have an opportunity to name it. And then the next natural question is why did somebody come up with that idea? Why was that created? You know, and so then you do, you get to talk about racism. Racism, you know, was, is a, is a, is a construct that has been used. Um, and I don't, I think the words you use or the examples you use or what you have them read changes, but I think, I do think it needs to be named. Um, I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, the silence, right, um, says a lot. When you don't answer the question, right. that even says more than when you do. Right. And, and when you don't answer the question, then it's no wonder that you have people who are now in their 30s and 40s and 50s and saying, I, I've never thought about my whiteness. I've never, you know. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, for me, you know, as a parent as of a Black child, we have to have this conversation so early that it, for us, it, it almost is another level of privilege that many white parents don't have to have the conversation. Um, and it was interesting, I posed this question on my social media in advance of this webinar, because I wanted to see where people were at. And I had someone on my social media say, I have to, we have to talk to our kids about this as soon as they get school age. Usually when they go into a place where there are going to be white kids, that are usually going to be saying or talking about things that they've heard their parents talk about and they may not be informed. We have to arm our children with knowledge. And part of that knowledge is the history of slavery in this country, which I find a lot of times white people in discussions are just uncomfortable with going there, with taking it back to where and how this all began. And so while they begin to talk about racism as a construct, I think we also can't be afraid to talk about how this began here uh, in this country. 
and that it was not just the racism against the enslaved Africans brought to this country in chains, but the racism against the Native Americans whose land was stolen. We just don't really go there. And so I, as a parent, I really hope as we go through this anti-racist, uh, um, you know, deprogramming of sorts, as we learn to move into this anti-racist theory, that we become um, vigilant about informing our children very early on about the history that Black parents must. Uh, and because I think then that lifts a level of privilege that we know that we know exists because we know you don't have to have the conversation. Speaking of privilege, Shelly, I want to throw this out to you. We had a question about white privilege. And we also had a question about that is the sensitivity about white fragility and the psychological complexity of it for white people by the people of color community, uh, is it reckless, right? Or is it an issue? In other words, if a glass bowl is fragile, should we be throwing it around all the time? Now, what I love about this question is because it is a very uncomfortable question. For me to read this question and I hear right, white fragility, I'm just like, get over it, right? We've got to have these conversations. But it's very real because I think as you sit in that privilege, in many ways, you feel like you are rightful in, you're, you're right in having a level of fragility because this is something that is new to you that you've never had to learn. Can you talk about white privilege? And in the white community, if you feel like in many of ways, in many ways do people of color, are we acting rec recklessly, I guess, when we are uh, not accepting of white fragility, which is connected to that privilege? So if I'm hearing you right and I'm understanding the question right, the idea is that somehow people of color are somehow responsible for treating white people more sensitively because we're sort of new with the conversation. Um, yes. Should we be more sensitive and, as they said, not throw a glass bowl around? Yeah. Um, I do not think that it's the responsibility of people of color to treat white people cautiously. Um, I think that it is um, white allies jobs and for every single white person on this call who is on the call because there is an intention to figure out how to be a white ally. It is our job to support other white people in reducing that fragility um, and doing so in a manner that, yeah, takes into account the psychological defenses. So I'll say a little bit about white fragility. Um, Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, is an excellent analysis of what's going on. Um, it is a very deep and provocative analysis, and I will say that because I remember reading, I think it was chapter two, and I got to a particular you know, paragraph and I read what she had written there and I went, oh, well, that's a three hour workshop <laughs> because <laughs> she did as best as she could to, you know, place herself in it and do the narratives and, um, and to make it as clear as possible in a way that could get her to all of the other information. But for white people who are new at this, I understand that it can be very overwhelming. I understand that it can be very hard and that needs to be used as just a little itty bitty window into the fact that it has been way harder for people of color to have to deal with all sorts of different things. That's more than just a bit of an emotional rub. And so there is, in my estimation, plenty, especially in Los Angeles, there are plenty of ways to reach out and get the support that we need as white people to be able to come together and cry and be upset and feel misunderstood and that our intentions aren't being taken into account. We can do that with each other. And then we can talk about why actually we need to, you know, kind of put that to the side and look deeper. And we've done enough work where we have the language to help each other do that because we've got hundreds of years of history where I as a white person have been trained to walk in the world in a way to not see that at every point I may be stepping into a pattern that is resonant 
to some pain that a person of color has had that has been deeply affecting for a very, very long time. So if a person of color reacts to something I've done that I think is just a small thing, but with a lot of emotion or a lot of pushback, I need to non-defensively understand that, oh, I stepped in something that's big. I may not have meant to, but this is not personal. The mm -hmm. reaction is not personal. The reaction is against hundreds of years of racism. And in that moment, I'm the face of it. I'm the face of hundreds of years of racism and I need to own it. I need to handle it because people of color have had to bear that face and negativity coming at them for all this time. And until we can do it and do it well, we're not going to be able to do the healing process that we need. Yeah, Shelly, that's what Black people call a word. You just thought that was a word. And I say that because, you know, oftentimes white people don't have a problem when their face gets them the benefit. But when their face, their skin color gives the burden, now we uncomfortable and we want to act like we're too fragile. That's where for us, we, we just say that that's just not going to work. And so, you know, I'm, I, shout out to all the schools who, uh, you know, are doing affinity spaces. I think those are great, um, you know, constructs to help people talk about this. We have them in our school where we have people of color affinity space. And then we also have the anti-white racist affinity space where white people can go in the room and talk about these things about you know, how I feel when I'm in it, because it is uncomfortable, but it ain't no more uncomfortable when you got 99 degrees and step up in the target and somebody want to look like you're about to steal something. And you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 we're all uncomfortable in this, in our own way. I want to throw to you, Christine, and I want to go to the next question because Shelly talked about going deeper and I want to go deeper because this question that was submitted asked, what factors um, what are the factors that prevent white people from becoming accomplices, right? As a white person, I feel like I'm always fumbling, white centering, or stepping on toes. How do I acknowledge and show support? I think that was a great question. Christina, what do you think? Oh, so many things. Um, <laughs> uh, I think... Well, it's connected to what I was thinking about in the previous question, which, you know, I just keep thinking this is, I think, something I want to say particularly to white mothers. Um, I think there's so much in the parenting zeitgeist that, you know, like, is it, a, is it too soon to talk to kids about an upsetting topic or something? And to the point you were making before, for white parents, that in and of itself is a privilege to even conceive, even think about that concept, right? And, and also, what are we protecting in ourselves when we're trying to do that with our kids, right? And what's the responsibility there? And, and even the thing of you know, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm nervous to show up or I'm nervous to go to, a, to a, an action or a meeting or whatever, because maybe they don't want me there or maybe, or, you know, and I, I, I don't know how to say it really, but it's like, it's not really about you. You know what I mean? It's, it is, it's about your process and, and we get to, but nobody's really gonna be watching anybody to the degree that we think they are. So just show up. If you're interested at all, that's really what, that's really all you need. Like center that, center that interest in softening a little bit about if you feel uncomfortable, that is the opening, that is the gift. But don't let it be the thing that keeps you continuing to be passively involved or actively involved. Let that uncomfortability be the thing that guides you to learn how to practice something differently. Um, and I know that sounds easier said than done, but I, I really think it's true. Like, as uncomfortable as we can be is, is absolutely vital in this. Um, and, and, and so then fumbling becomes, becomes par part, of the, part of the practice, right? It becomes part of the practice. And, um, and we will, and we do and we get to learn. And, and the more that I show up and I 
try and I'm willing to be vulnerable and say, I don't know, or I'm willing to be vulnerable and say, oh, I, I see that thing that I didn't see before. Um, it grows my muscle of, of being able to um, be, be more aware and more present about other people's experience and more, um, more able to be brave in my uh, choices about how I carry myself in the world and, and the conversations that I'm able to have with other people um, and the actions that I'm able to take uh, in support. Yeah, I think we, we don't want to be selective where we're brave, right? And where we fumble. I mean, you, you look at sex education in schools, that is an, always an awkward conversation. I haven't met, you know, a teacher that doesn't kind of feel uncomfortable about when they get to that place where they have to begin to talk to children about, you know, issues concerning their body, issues concerning, you know, development. But we do it because there's a wealth of information there and there's value in it. I think the same happens with the fumbling that you're talking about as it relates to race conversations. When they're not perfect, right? They're, 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 they're going to go off the syllabus and the, and, and the topic. But if we create a brave and safe space to talk about these things, I think the value is priceless. Um, you know, I, I want to follow up with a question that someone asked about um, schools and diversity. Someone asked, why is it important to make a clear distinction for ethnic diversity? I asked because I thought our school was diverse, but it's not ethnically diverse. Does that matter? How does that impact my white daughter and more important, the few ethnically diverse students? Love this question because we throw this word diversity around all the time, right? And it means, it really means something different for so many people on many different levels, right? Straight up, when I walk in a room and they tell me it's diverse, I'm looking for how many black people are in here, right? And then you realize, oh, okay, we're counting Asian children, we're counting all these different children in this, this percentage of diversity, okay? But that often leaves many black children without any critical mass, where, where they're lumped in. And you know, in, in our experience in this country, when other cultures are more aligned with white, mm -hmm. right? Our diversity feels a whole lot different than others. And so I think we are throwing that word around in schools and we have to make sure that that's why, in my opinion, the racial diversity is so important. But I'd love to hear you know, your thoughts. Um, Christina, you've got, you know, you're a mom and then I'd like to hear your thoughts as well, Shelley, as a former teacher or as a teacher. Yeah, I think I'll just, I'll say that, you know, I think this is my husband is a teacher at a university and I think this is coming up everywhere that having, you know, a handful of students of different ethnicities and the bulk of them being white is it, it's, it's not a, we're not looking for a word that's going to make everything seem okay. It has, it doesn't begin to address curriculum. It doesn't begin to address who the teachers are that are, that are teaching the curriculum, you know, the, 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 the kinds of stories that are told and carried. It doesn't, um, so I, I don't know how to answer that question in a deeper way and I'm, and I'm not an educator, but I think everybody is really being turned. I think there's a big turning over around people realizing we, how, how deeply centered the white experience is in every aspect of our schooling, yes. um, including by being the majority of students and really for a long time saying we're diverse because there's a black student, because there's an Asian student, because there's a, you know, and that it's not. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like diversity means, you know, it's like friends, you got the one black character that comes on or whatever, you know, it's, it's that fake diversity and, and, and we know that's not working. Shelly, what are your thoughts quickly? We've got about five more questions, but just about 10 more minutes. So I want to move through, but as a, a teacher, I do want to understand your thoughts. 
I think there's only one thing I'll add, which is something we need to be really cautious of. I think the question is using ethnicity as a proxy for race. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, that's not exactly the same thing, number one. And, and number two, when we do that, we actually end up pushing the the need to pay attention to race off to the side. Um, there's another element in there I want to invite the, the questioner to think about, which is, and it came up in the way we were, we collectively were talking about it. People of color are seen to have ethnicity. People of color are seen to have a race, but white kids are not. It, it's again, that default thing. And so um, we have to be cautious that when, when we say, oh, you know, well, there's, there's our diversity. Diversity is not a person. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's not a person. I, I actually, in many ways, I feel like it's an experience, right? Because a room can feel diverse to one person and not to another. And it feels mm. so subjective sometimes. And I don't know if we've ever gotten to the real objective standard. Because I think the objective standard of diversity that exists in our country today still very much aligns with the white experience and the white majority. It doesn't, it hasn't played out as being very diverse uh, for someone who, um, someone who, who often looks for that and craves that experience. So that was interesting. I like that. I, I want to follow up with you, Shelley, because we got a question about um, like being in school and it says, how, how is it possible? that so much has happened. And so many of us, I think they mean white people, haven't been aware about how bad it really is or how it can be to be a black person in America. The daily worry about microaggressions and let alone being in an all white private school. How, can, how is it that white people can be so basically uninformed in, in the school environment? Uh, because we're very self-focused and most white people live largely segregated lives to this day, both in housing and employment and friendship circles. And a lot of us here in LA might think, oh no, we live in LA, it's so diverse here. However, LA is a very, very, very segregated area. And even if we have people of color in our lives, as white people, very, very often the relationships that we have are typically not deep enough to hear the details of their lived experience mm -hmm. in regards to race. Mm -hmm. We too often say things that reveal early on that we aren't safe for them to share with us. Um, so we're likely to respond dismissively or defensively or otherwise question the, people's lived experience. Even if we don't know that we're doing it, there are so many ways we're giving signals that this person isn't gonna understand, so why bother? And so even our cross-race friendships sometimes, I mean, don't, don't capture it all. And so we remain ignorant. Um, that's on the personal level. And then institutionally, there's a lot. Um, I mean, here we're talking to parents mostly of, right, um, students who are going to independent schools. And I think parents, uh, white parents who are on this call should ask themselves, to what degree did you think about whether the school that you selected for your child would focus on revealing racial inequities in society? Mm. Did you ask about that when you were interviewing and before you paid your tuition? And if you didn't, what makes you think that the school would decide to focus on it? Mm -hmm. yep. You're spot on because I did. I stood behind, I waited behind every tour and pulled the admission person aside and asked them about their curriculum, about how many teachers of color. I asked them all those questions, but I was the only one standing there. Um, but I will say this uh, as we move into the next question, uh, the whitewashing of curriculum, I think, is huge in terms of an institution, uh, you know, an institutional approach to this as well, because um, kids of color, especially black kids, can go through an entire private school experience and never have a black teacher, never have, uh, you know, books uh, that have black authors or where the black protagonist, the books we do get, the black protagonist, they either load, you know, go down, damn near on the verge of a, a Negro spiritual after every chapter. They're never the heroine. And usually there's a great white hope that comes in to save the day because God knows the black folk can't save themselves. So I think this is all very important conversation as we think about the microaggressions that other parents have no idea 
that when they read that story or when they study about the institution of slavery and what it means and how it came to this country and it's a small paragraph. When it's a small paragraph, then that leads a white child to believe that it's just a small moment in our history where black people, we know that it is still 401 years later affecting every single day of our life. And the reason why black men and women are getting gunned down in the streets and no one's being prosecuted for it. So I do think that is, um, I think that is very important for them to see that it comes from so many different places, not just the people, but the institution as well. Um, I got a follow up question here from Lisa, just how does white, how do white parents ask the question without isolating someone, right? And then appointing them as the sole voice of the black community. And I, I, I think what she's asking, and black people have all been there, when you're in a room with all white people, you become the voice of all black America. And it's like, and why do black people do this? And why do black people do that? And it's kind of like, well, I can't speak for all black people, but I can talk about my black experience or the history. How do white people ask questions? How would you recommend that? Because many black people get offended by, you know, people assuming that now, you know, it's like they get to the slavery section, you know, in a class and everybody looks at the one black kid, you know, and, and then the black kid is like, oh, you know, this is heavy for me. How do you ask those questions? Anybody? <laughs> it was a tough one, right? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, on, honestly, um, if what I'm doing is talking to, I mean, am I, I would say something different if I'm talking to black parents and how to em empower their children to be able to say that's not a question for me. <laughs> um, okay. I, and it, to be able to say that if that's what they want to say. I mean, I really, I really hold this as tenderly in a, in a living in the tension kind of situation as possible where we, want, we don't want to take away a young person's right to answer a question when they want to take it on, but to be able to say, no, not right now. This, is, this shouldn't be my job right now. Um, and be able to have that ownership of, of their own capacity to engage or not engage. Um, I think white people all too often do expect um, people of color and then unfortunately young people of color to be that voice. And um, what I say to, to white folks is, you know, there is a way to educate yourself first. Do not rely on people of color to answer questions for you. People of color have published everything you need to know. Right. Everything you need to know. Um, that said, we also don't want to treat people of color as though we cannot speak with them about race. That also would be dehumanizing because there are plenty of people who do want to have that engagement and build that relationship. And so I think the critical point is building the kind of relationship and the personal knowledge base for white people where you can actually have done enough to say, yeah, you know, I've been learning all about this stuff. I've been thinking about this stuff. Are you interested in this conversation with me? Mm. That's a very different approach because then you're, you're allowing somebody to, to speak if they want to speak on the subject. You're not assuming they wouldn't want to speak on it, but you're not also being expectant. And that's the best way I can hold people's humanity while holding my white self as responsible for learning as I can. Got it. Well, moving on from that point, there's a question that says, how can private schools be a safe space for our black children? My daughter, has a group of black friends and when they get together her non-black friends get upset and feel excluded even complaining to teachers or their parents how can we help her non-black friends and their friends understand instead of making them feel badly for being together similarly when students start to notice skin differences or make connections in a kindergarten classroom they tend to name their class they, they tend to name their classmates who are black how do we support are black students when this comes up? So that's a loaded question, um, but feel free. Maybe you can tackle it. Um, you know, it deals a lot with, you know, the dreaded, you know, socializing and it is very tough on black students. And as we talk about building allies and co-conspirators and anti-racist children, Christina, what are your thoughts on um, what private schools could, can do to make them safer for black children um, and, and help inform parents, help teach children. What do you think 
could happen could that could help this because there is a social dynamic of being the only or one of the few black children on a campus um, that's really really challenging yeah I'm thinking of the thing that it's making me think of is that it again it's like we're 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 noticing the impact that this is having on the black child or the black children, mm -hmm. but it's something that's being perpetrated by the white students. And so how do we make it the conversation with the white students about what's going on? What, what, like, do you see what, like, I'm curious about the ways that you could start to unpack for, a, yes. for the white kids like what's what's going on? What's what does it feel like to you to not be in 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 the group or whatever the question might be? But to change the whole orientation, the same thing when you were talking about when slavery is taught in a class and everybody looks to the black student. Let's ask the white students, you know, like the 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 creators and the owners of the behavior that we're now looking for a black person to tell us what what they must know about it like how do we shift the focus so that the questions are being asked of the perpetrators of the system the holders of the of the the holders up of this of the system i don't know that i have the answer to it but it's what i'm thinking about yes did you want to can i add yes I know, I know we're running out of time, but there are two resources that really impact this that I feel like are super important. What got me on, on my journey of paying attention to issues of being white was a, a book that came out over 20 years ago. It's got a 20th anniversary and it's just as relevant now as it was then. Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations on race by Beverly Daniel Tatum. She is a miracle of psychological and educator insight. It is absolutely required reading because if we understand the dynamics, we can better help our, our kids understand why it's perfectly not only okay, but often very important that kids of color have that ability to be together to support mm -hmm. one another because of all of the other stuff going on. Um, a second resource is one that even though I'm not a parent, I read it cover to cover and it is a miracle of a book and it is called Raising White Kids and it's by Jennifer Harvey. And what is so um, important about it is that um, it gives you a lot of stories about what this parent's journey was like in having the conversations from a very, very young age all the way through high school um, and, and actually really how to do that. And she's got some um, uh, essays online as well as videos that you can watch. Jennifer Harvey. This is awesome because you, you, um, you know, kind of leading me into, I got two more questions. I know we're a little past, past eight. I hope it's okay, but this is such a great conversation. I want to get to uh, one last question and then my final question. Um, it says, my son is averse to listening to the news. This is great. And I won't go through the whole thing, but basically this parent is asking, your son doesn't really want to look at the news. Now, um, you know, she thinks it's important to, you know, kind of highlight the importance of raising your voice and the power of collection, collective action. She's asking, should she require her child to look at the news occasionally or just take his cues and leave him alone? And then how do we adequate, adequately educate and engage an unwilling, in, in uh, parentheses, middle school child? So we know developmentally our middle school children are definitely in, in, in a phase of growth, um, but I understand this parent's concern. They want them to be informed, but if they don't want to be bothered with it, is that is that healthy? Do you think that's healthy given what is going on in our in our country today? I'm happy to jump in on this, Christina, if you don't mind, <laughs> be because um, there's a couple things going on. Um, one is that the research I've been doing in the last two and a half years is all about the rise of white nationalism and their online recruitment efforts. And so if you have a white child, then it is absolutely essential that you get really comfortable engaging with your child about what your child is engaging with online. So it's not so much about saying, hey, you know, 
child here look over here at this and what's going on but i would actually suggest what's your child paying attention to what do they think about it at, who are they engaging with who are the people on youtube that they're watching and what do they make of what they have to say how are they learning to see the world and experience the world because things can get really out from under you um, before you know it and therefore what I strongly suggest is become a co-conspirator with, with your kid about what they're seeing and how they're interpreting the world. And then when it comes to, you know, paying attention to the, the sort of the political landscape of this world, my suggestion is that allow your child to witness your engagement. If, mm -hmm. if all you're doing is yelling at the TV, you know, we know that our actions speak louder than words with our kids. So be that active person that your child will then witness um, and their activity will then most likely develop as they age. That would be my thought. That, that's, that's great. That's great information. Uh, and just as the last question and follow up to that, how can we keep these crucial conversations going amongst parents and families in our school community so the momentum uh, being built right now doesn't peter out. I love that question. And like I said, I am the co-chair of a multicultural discussion group at our school, which is, um, it's a lifesaver. We come in every Friday and there are 20 to 30 parents. We invite administration, teachers, everyone to come in and we have tough, uncomfortable conversations every week. If you don't have something like that at your private school, uh, get to starting it immediately because it definitely puts you in a room with people who want to do the work. It often restores your faith when your children come home harmed by the microaggressions or the macroaggressions or just flat out racist practices of some of the kids and having a village uh, in your school where you know people are concerned about matters of race and equality uh, is, is um, invaluable. Please, uh, Christina, Shelley, please weigh in on this because I think this is one of the most important things we need to leave our families with today, our action items. What can we do to keep these important conversations going in our school community? Yeah, I think there's infinite value in starting with people you know and whose lives you, uh, you know, are in, in schools. And I think, I think, like I said, with the, the interest, uh, even if you have a sense about it, just start, start with two people <laughs> um, and grow from there. And then there are places that are really diving into these conversations in, in particular, you know, AWARE um, holds four dialogues a month. Um, usually they're all over the county, but now they're all virtual. And they're an incredible place to just spend some more time talking and listening and delving in on, on challenging questions about uh, whiteness and, and, and what anti-racism racism means. Um, you know, if you wanna take action, come to White People for Black Lives. There are lots and lots of different, different places to find support around this. Um, and, you, you know, like Shelley I was talking about the um, white nationalists, separation breeds the ability for these kinds of uh, systems to continue. And so we have to find a way to be in community with each other. And I just, one thing I wanna say that may feel out of left field, but like the protection of white children and the protection of white women protecting their children is a tool of all of these problems. And it's something that we're taught as white women to be proud of, to protect our children, to, to keep them safe, to, you know, and the, our relationship to that comes from a lot of privilege. And, mm -hmm. and it's a real thing, I think, to break down as, as white parents and and white women and what we're taught about what it means to be a good mom and yada, yada, yada. Um, in order to have these brave conversations and raise children who, who are, are gonna be aware of the world. Um, yeah, so. that, that could be an entire uh, <laughs> song. You just really set us up for a great discussion, Christina.
because when you talked about the protection, white women protecting their children, so much of what we do as black mothers in protection of our children is the exact opposite. You may not have the conversation or expose them to the ills of the world because you want to protect them from having the experience. You know, white people, you know, they get to experience the world in a different way. On the contrary, as a black mother, I am constantly informing my son right. out of protection of what he cannot do, what he cannot say, what he will not wear, even down to after a certain time, don't have your hood up. Already teaching him at nine years old while we're riding in the car, should this ever happen? If you're ever in a room alone with a white girl, I don't care who it is and I don't care what age it is, you leave immediately. You're never alone. Like these are things that are as black mothers we have to teach, very real things. And it is out of protection. It is, it is out of what history has taught us that anything can happen and your child will be guilty until proven innocent or dead. And so this is, this is a very interesting conversation. I would love to take this up more. Shelly, could you weigh in please on the, our, our last question about how to keep these conversations going? Um, I think Christina um, offered a lot. I will just say that um, I created and sent over um, a, a resource sheet that's going to be sent out to everybody that has live links for how to access what Christina is talking about. Um, oh. Whether it's an ongoing dialogue that is local to LA um, or um, discussion groups based around a book. Um, uh, there, there are ways to engage. There's other opportunities, especially now. Um, those of us who run these conversations are trying to offer as many avenues on ramps, as we as we call it, to get people engaged and keep people engaged. So look out for that look uh, that list. Um, click around on the links and see what's available. Speaking of clicking and a list, Private School Village is going to be sending out a survey uh, after this webinar. Please take time to fill it out. Uh, they want to know your thoughts. They also want to know what other subjects you'd like to have webinars um, concerning. These are important conversations that they are uh, literally taking that leap to give us when we are so in need. Um, and I'll say this, this is my own shameless plug and not from them. Please support this organization. It is doing absolutely incredible things for uh, many children who feel marginalized and disenfranchised in private schools. Uh, support, the, support the programming. You can go and follow them. There's, uh, there's links to donate, but the programming has been amazing. I'm not just a moderator. I'm also a member of the village. My son has taken part in many of the pro much of the programming, and uh, we need it. Um, lastly, I just want to say, uh, this has been such a fascinating conversation. You know, I want to say thank you to Shelly and you, Christina, for just being so open and just so, I love how real and matter of fact you are able to talk about white life, white privilege and race. It gives me hope that we will be able to continue to have these conversations without, you know, a white person in tears or their guilt making them so uncomfortable that we can't push past it and really learn from one another. I learned a lot from you this evening. I know our families did as well. I thank you so much for joining us and sharing your truth and your message. I thank you to everyone for joining this conversation and being willing to be open and to push past fear and being uncomfortable to be empowered. I'd like to sign off now. We're a little bit past time, but again, support Private School Village, fill out your survey, and uh, we look forward to seeing you during the next conversation. Remember, it takes a village, mm. and we want to make that village as powerful as possible. All right? Let's raise these children the right way. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.